Sixers, Celtics, James Harden. What on earth is he wearing? Someone explain that to me. What? What is that? Hey, it's all about comfort. He looks very comfortable heading into the arena. That's all you're asking. Joel, for. Embi- Joel Embiid was comfortable uh, on the bench for the Sixers, but James Harden made himself comfortable all night long. What a performance. And he had to come out and find a rhythm early. This isn't the kind of game that you can kind of pick your spots. He had to be the offense for them, and he was early. Let's show you how this game was decided. Again, no Embiid. You figure the Celtics are going to cruise, but that's Tyrese Maxey on a play that they would eventually change to a block. It's a one-point game. Underneath to Al Horford on the other side. Celtics by three. 36 seconds left. Malcolm Brogdon with the ball. Malcolm Brogdon. Oh, what is that? Absolutely no idea. Out of his peripheral, he obviously thought he saw a teammate, but that was just terrible spacing on the part of the Celtics. Easiest basket Tyrese Maxey will have all season. That was like Fred Brown to James Worthy. Uh, Spoiler alert, that's a very old play. All right, next Celtics possession. Let's get to the bottom line. Celtics down one. Final 30 seconds. Jason Tatum fouled. Makes them both. Boston by one. 15 seconds left. How about Harden? Yeah, this is unbelievable right here. He gets the guy he wants on him. Gets Horford on a switch. He knows what he's going to go to. He loves going right for that step back. Horford, pretty decent contest. But by that point, Harden was in perfect rhythm to make that shot. 45 points for James Harden. One last chance. Boston. That's Marcus Smart driving to the basket. Jason Tatum called for the foul. Harden wills the Sixers to an absolutely stunning win. 119-115. Boston drops a bad one at home. James, how about it? We didn't come in the game expecting to lose. You know what I mean? Like, we are here to win. And even after this game, I told the guys, don't get too happy. Like, we even kill. You know what I mean? Like, we're coming here to get game two as well. And so that's the mindset that we have as a unit. I thought that he had just the perfect mindset tonight. He really did. I was so, I'm so happy for him uh, because it just tells you what he, he can do on given nights. It's amazing. The guy's a, a Hall of Famer, and, and all you hear is the other stuff about him. Uh, you really do, and he was, he was fantastic. Alan Hahn, who was that at James Harden that we saw? That, that was turning back the clock. It feels like almost a decade on a 45-point night that no one saw coming. That is the player that every team that has had him, whether it's Oklahoma City, whether it's Houston, Brooklyn as well, and in Philadelphia, that's the player that they want on a regular basis. They just don't get him on a regular basis, especially in the postseason. But that was the guy that understood the mission. There's no Joel Embiid. Somebody's got to carry this team. Somebody's got to do the scoring. And he went back in the way back machine and let everybody know, as of course he's in a contract year, that he can do it. Listen, I mean, legs, it's... Did you see this coming? Did anyone see this coming? When I saw that Embiid had been ruled out, I thought to myself, all right, you're Philly, you're psychologically punting on yeah. game one and hoping that he can come back. And they came out and fought in that first half, and then Harden just took over. I've been as critical of James Harden as anybody because of the you know, questions he's had in the clutch throughout his career. The one thing I said before this game yesterday was, in a lot of ways, the pressure was taken off of him because no one's expecting him to win the game. And he knew exactly how he had to play. Like, so I think sometimes in the past when he has struggled in big moments, he's overthinking about when to be a facilitator and attacker, right? And he, you see him run into that. That wasn't the issue last night. He knew what he needed to. The question was, could he do it? Could you find that kind of shooting rhythm from deep? Because if he's not making step back threes, this isn't possible. Right? He can't just get to the rim and get to the line all night and beat the Celtics. He had to find that jump shot. And he did early in the game. But I think it was one of those, we have nothing to lose. No one thinks we can win this game. Let me go out there. And in a lot of ways, he was free of mind and very relaxed. They're going to announce the MVP of the league tonight on TNT. And the overwhelming expectation is that Joel Embiid is going to win it. All of a sudden, are we living in a world where even without him, the Sixers actually have a chance to win games in this series against a team most people are already penciling into the final? I'll tell you what. What I learned about the Boston Celtics so far, not just in that game last night, but in the first round, they're not championship contenders because they don't take it seriously enough. How could you possibly mess around in that first round and have to go six games against the Hawks? And then you do it in game one. On your home floor. Like, you're playing at home. The other team doesn't have its star. And I heard Jason Tatum say after the game, you know, we were lacking some intensity. You were lacking what? This is a playoff game. It's the second round. How am I to take you seriously as a championship contender 
if you are messing around with games like this. I know you have a closer look at it because it left a lot of us scratching our heads. You got a lot of explaining to do if you're Missoula. Coming, coming out of timeout, this is what you draw up. Let me just, for those that don't, you know, don't know the Boston Celtics all that well, let me just introduce you to a couple people. This is Jason Tatum. He's their best player. Uh, this is Jalen Brown. He's their second best player. Just so we know where we're going with this. And it's not that Marcus Smart is not a capable offensive player. But the fact that you're going to try to take advantage of Marcus Smart in the post, okay, this night he's got four field goals at this point. But this is what you're going to try to do. You're going to go with a direct entry right to the post, thinking you're going to take advantage of some sort of matchup. So we get Marcus Smart in the post. Now, catch it. Now, the problem here is look at the spacing on the weak side of this as this is starting. And here's the bigger problem for me. Al Horford comes down. Right? He's setting this screen. This is his defender right here. Al Horford is right on the elbow. If Al Horford instead comes out here to the three-point line, now this guy's got a decision because he's a very capable three-point shooter. Mm -hmm. doesn't happen. So he just sits in the lane and basically in the lap of Marcus Smart. But then look at Jason Tatum. What exactly are you trying to accomplish with this pass? There are three defenders in there. There's no spacing. Al Horford is at the elbow. And, oh, by the way, here's Jalen Brown. Your other all-star who's just floating around on the perimeter. And obviously this doesn't turn out well. The pass is intercepted. The Sixers get free throws and basically ice the game. I have absolutely no idea how this is what you come up with to go to in that situation. If you think you got some sort of matchup advantage with Marcus Smart, great. Make sure he's got the entire lane to himself then to try to muscle somebody to the rim and get to the line. It almost looked like they were premeditating that he was going to be able to get that drop-off pass in that tight a window with five people within five or six feet of each other. Nobody in the league is making that pass, but I just don't understand how you don't put the ball in Jason Tatum's hand to make them react to him where maybe you get a double team somebody gets an open look or Tatum gets a shot himself. I feel the same way and, and Tatum sort of looks like he's gathering himself for a rebound. Mm -hmm. Tatum looks to me like he thinks Smart is going to shoot the yeah. ball. Uh, you know, right? His, his body language is sort of like he's looking for an offensive yeah. rebound. You're right. The spacing is nowhere. Jalen Brown's not even involved no. in the play. No, and, and what you also saw there as you were pointing out is that the minute Marcus gets the ball in the post, he's going. Yeah. Like there is no turn and look and see what happens with that screen action. Reed completely ignores all that and comes over to double right away. So it's if he also knows there's eight seconds on the clock. Marcus is trying to shoot this ball. I'm coming for the double. The whole play blows up. But this is just another example of the, of the Celtics looking like a team that is ill prepared in a lot of situations and relying so much on talent. I'll tell you what, did you guys get the feeling in watching this last night? I, I kept making notes and I was saying, does this in any way feel like a playoff game? Yeah, it was a weird atmosphere. Nothing yeah. about it. There was no physicality defensively on either side. The, the crowd was completely out of the game. They had a little bit of a burst in the fourth quarter when they, when they took the lead. But for the most part, it felt completely different than the second game that we watched with the energy, the intensity, the physicality, the importance of the moment. I didn't see any of that out of the Boston Celtics. And that's what you've been alluding to. Like, where is the sense of urgency? Without Joel Embiid, this loss is inexcusable. There's yes. no other word for it. You cannot lose a game with the MVP of the league not playing at home in game one. You just didn't come out with the right approach, and their execution down the stretch was awful. Quickly, and I mean, I, I, I don't even like the idea that we're talking potentially about load managing in a playoff series, but if you've stolen one on the road, we've had this conversation and will again about Jimmy Butler and the Heat tonight here in New York. If you've stolen this game on the road, do you sit Joel Embiid for game two? Yes, absolutely would. If he's not even close to 70%, I'm not playing him. I don't have to play him. I proved already that I can win on the road without him, and I want him to get as close to 100% if he's not going to be but get as close to it why because when I go home now and if he's ready to play I can win this series James Harden made up Joel Embiid's mind last night and yeah. that's why Joel Embiid was so happy when that game ended he made up his mind he made up Doc Rivers mind the Celtics made up Doc Rivers mind there's no decision now you give him all that extra time to get ready for game three now you got the split that you wanted now look if if, if he wakes up feeling 95 percent that's right. a different story right. but it doesn't sound like he's close to that and this is something that he could further injure himself well look here's the reality Injuries have been the storyline of this entire postseason. All right, we opened with it this morning, and Jay Will makes his way across the hall from KJM on ESPN Radio. I mean, James Harden turning back the clock. And before we get to what the Celtics didn't do, just a moment on what Harden did do and in the big picture what that might mean for Philly. I mean, think about what the conversation would have been today, Greeny, if James Harden had a stinker. 
We've been talking about, does he deserve a bigger contract this offseason? What does this mean for Joel Embiid? Will he stay with the Philadelphia 76ers? There would have been a lot of questions looming around this organization and decisions made about why they brought James Harden in the first place if he didn't have a prolific game. Flowers to him last night for one of the best performances we've seen in the playoffs thus far. I mean, that's a player that I think many of us had forgotten existed, right? We've seen that before, but it almost seemed like an apparition, like something we haven't seen in so long. It almost was like it had happened in a dream. I, I, I got to say this, and with all due respect to James Harden, it's a prolific performance. The hell are the Celtics doing, okay, Green? <laughs> what ahead. are they doing? Go, you tell what me. What are you talking? Why are you in drop coverage? Like, why? Like, James Harden's coming up screens and he's getting open jump shots like me at the YMCA. I don't understand that. Why are they switching everything? I know that's their scheme. But how many times do I need to see Al Horford guarding James Harden after he's been cooking the whole game? And the bigger question I've had for the Celtics, but they tricked game five against the Atlanta Hawks yeah. when Trey Young went off. This is a team that was in the NBA Finals last year. You know why? Because they had an identity. They're in an identity crisis mode right now. I don't know who they are. Jason Tatum was not only the best offensive player, but he locked up Kevin Durant. Jalen Brown was a lockup defender. Marcus Smart was defensive player of the year. I don't know who this team is when I watch them play, and it's so concerning. Well, I, I feel like maybe we should mention, in case there's anyone who doesn't realize it, that the biggest change from last year is the coach. That Ime Udoko was the coach, and he was a defensive-minded guy. And in many, you know, he was a defensive coordinator type, if you will, before he became a head coach. And now he is no longer there. And so Joe Mazzulla is coaching the team, and perhaps that's part of what they're missing, some of that experience and that defensive toughness. When you watch the Clippers play the season without Kawhi and without Paul they George. They play hard. Why did they play hard? Who because, set the tone? Because they knew they had Who to. Who set the tone? Who but do you think is, set the tone? Are you telling me Russell it's Westbrook, right? Uh, okay. Uh, I thought, or me, Ty Lue. I didn't or know Ty, if you yeah. – You could say Ty Lue too. Okay. All right. So as a player on the floor, and I, I get the whole Joe Missoula thing, but I live in a world of no excuses. Okay. Who sets the identity for the Boston Celtics? Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart. No? I mean, is that is – that, is that, who you wanted me to lead to? Because it feels Jason like Tatum. that was the identity of that team last year, was his toughness. He pulled the two superstars together when they didn't seem to mesh, right, Tatum and Brown, and then he sort of developed that defensive identity, won defensive player of the year, and that's how they got to the final. What I'm saying now is that team has cemented itself as who they were. Like, the next step for them is to get over that hump, and I think that starts with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And I hear Marcus Smart's voice, and I know he's one of the leaders of the team, right? I think sometimes his voice can wear on people. I think it has to get to a point where the best player on the team, if that's Jason Tatum, somebody needs to galvanize his team and have them draw a line in the sand. Green. I feel like I want to ask you a big question here before we move on to the Lakers and the work. Are they in trouble? Would you say the Celtics right now, how would you describe the level of trouble you see them in in this series right now? I would now? say 75. I was worried about the Celtics in the last series, Greeny. Think about the West – they are going to beat up on each other. Yeah. We saw a physical game last night between the Suns and the Nuggets. Right. We're also witnessing on the other section another rough physical game. They're going to – Lakers-Warriors start tonight. Going to beat up on each other. You're telling me if you're the Celtics, you're saying, hey, the MVP, the MVP of this league is not playing. We're going to beat them by 30 tonight. Yeah. We're going to set the tone. We're going to get game two. And by the way, we're going to play the winner of Miami and New York. We're going to be waiting in the, in the world championship for the winner of this other series that are going to beat each other up. It's wide open for them, but it doesn't seem like they want to grab the mantle and take it. Yeah, Embiid will be named MVP. We expect him to be named MVP tonight. Legler earlier called that loss inexcusable from Boston last night. Terrible. And I think that's the right word. Who has the edge in superstar? How do we choose between LeBron and Steph Curry? Well, look, I, I'm going to take Steph here. Here in this one, they're going to have to play Vanderbilt on Steph or they're going to play Dennis Schroeder on Steph. And I think either way, uh, there is nobody on the Lakers roster that can guard him the way Davion Mitchell tried to guard him. They don't have the legs like that. Vanderbilt has size, but this guy runs over three miles a game. Alan Hahn, who has the edge in second star, co-star, if you will, Anthony Davis or Clay Thompson? It would be Anthony Davis, and he just came off of a, a series where he averaged 20, 14, and four block shots against the defensive player of the year candidate in, in Jalen uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. If he can do that against Kevon if he can do that against him, against Kevon Looney, he will dominate. Legs, who has the edge in depth? Golden State of the Lakers. Let me define depth first, because a lot of times people think that means bench. For me, it means impact of guys that aren't stars in mm -hmm. this series. Okay, so take LeBron, AD, Clay, and Steph out of the equation. 
Look at the rest of those guys in the starting lineup and whatever one or two guys you get off the bench, bigger impact. I'm going with the Warriors because I think the, I think Wiggins is going to be big in this series. All right, so then let's go back, however, to the superstars for a moment, if we can. LeBron and Curry, they've been at the center of this league for over the past decade. Since 2011, we've seen LeBron James in nine finals, Steph Curry in six, both have won four in that span as one who chronicles the sport and have for a very long time. How do we define what's at stake for LeBron James and Steph Curry over the next two weeks? Now there's legacy here. There's legacy at stake because you just saw the stat that LeBron James is one in three in series against Steph Curry. And if Steph Curry wins this series and let's just say continues on for a fifth ring uh, while beating LeBron on the way, what does that mean in this era now? Because he will have more championships than LeBron. Look, look, I mean, the league always belongs to someone, right? Going back to whatever point you want to say, it was Russell's league, and then it was, at some point, it became Magic and Larry, then it became Michael's league, then it became Kobe, then it, it, it has been LeBron's league for 15 years. But is it possible that when all is said and done, we will look at this era and say, historically speaking, Steph Curry was actually the most significant player? Is, yeah, that, is that possible? Absolutely possible. And absolutely now, that's a legitimate debate where, where it wouldn't have been necessarily. What Steph Curry has done in the last two years, you think about what he had already accomplished. Yeah. Right? A unanimous MVP, two MVPs, multiple titles. What he has done in the last two years, the number of rungs on the ladder that he has climbed, when you start ranking historical greatness, it's absolutely incredible. I almost feel like in a lot of ways, LeBron is cemented at two. Like, even if he wins this series, wins another title, people aren't going to leapfrog Michael Jordan. He's kind of locked in there. Look at the ground Steph Curry has made up on the all-time greats in the last two years alone. And if he wins this series and wins another title, add a couple more runs to that list. What do you think, Jay? Oh, yeah. I, I feel like every time, look, these two were born in the same hospital in Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Think about that. <laughs> right? And they're the two best players of our generation. That's what we're witnessing right now. Every time they link up, it's a battle for the best player of our generation to watch. That's what's on the line here. I mean, look, you, know, you could say legs that LeBron could be cemented as two. That might be the case, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going to start making arguments that Steph wins another one for him to be top five. And it gets into this thing like, who's better, Steph or LeBron? Like, that's the conversation, Greeny. I, I think that is the conversation that stems from this. We get one more dance, if you will, since that's sort of the term that gets used now between these two all-time greats. Next, Cindy, put my full screen up there. I want to make a point uh, when we talk about depth, if you will, Jay, and I'll come to you as I ask you, who's the most important player or what will decide it? Look at this series against Memphis. When the Lakers' leading scorer was anyone but LeBron James or Anthony Davis, they didn't lose a single game and so to me it feels like and I, I would defer of course to your expertise it feels to me like if it isn't just LeBron and AD they count on that's the Lakers chance to win when they get monster games from the Hachimuras and the Austin Reeves of the world or D'Angelo Russell as they did in that game six that to me is the Lakers chance to agree win. and I, I think this is going to be a series in which Austin Reeves D'Lo Dennis Schroeder these guys have to make shots because if I'm Darvin Ham, I'm not allowing LeBron James to bring the ball up the court. They're going to have Andrew Wiggins on him. I'm going to try to punish him in the block. Now, we have Vanderbilt guarding likes of Steph Curry. Look for Draymond Green to play off of Vanderbilt. So LeBron's always going to see two. So like, they might have to go small sometimes, Legs, and have Schroeder and D'Lo in the game instead of Vanderbilt, who's better defensively on Steph. There's going to be a big challenge for the Lakers defensively, right? To what they just faced in the last round, static sets. where We know where it's coming from. High ball, scream of jaw. Let's load up on the paint. Throw it into Jaron Jackson Jr. to post a few times and maybe some Bane with some screening action. Mm -hmm. This is different. This is all player movement. This is a guy willing to run from one side of the court to the other three times in the same possession without touching it and impact everybody else getting great shots. That requires an incredible amount of communication. You've got to be seamless on your switches, on your hedges, on your jump outs, all of those things. And Curry's going to see a lot more of that than he did in the last round with the Kings because they kind of never really changed how they played him. Lakers will, but it's just going to require so much. And that's why I think the challenge ultimately is going to be a little bit too much for them defensively. For what it's worth, the Warriors have not lost a Western Conference playoff series since 2014, since before this era really began. But that brings me to my final question, and Alan, I will start it with you. Should the winner of this series, whoever it is, be considered the favorite to win the championship? No, I, I, I want to say I think Vegas will do that because the public's going to see LeBron James or Steph Curry and think I'm putting my money on those guys because I trust those guys in the Western Conference Finals and NBA Finals. But what I'm seeing out of the Denver Nuggets is telling me we got to start talking more about the Denver Nuggets. So you think you would favor at this moment 
the Nuggets over either of these teams, whichever one they get. What I've seen so far, why, yes. Why do we continue to be so disrespectful towards the Nuggets? I mean, I, I'm on my show. Afterthought, I have to fight Jay. To talk about <laughs> if the job Aaron Gordon is doing on Kevin Durant or Jokic having 35 last night, it's just mind boggling to me that they have been the favorite. Like, we get caught up into brand names. Oh, Kevin Durant mm-hmm. and, and Devin Booker. And did you see what they did to them last well, night? Kevin Durant and Devin Booker are not just brand names, right? They're two of the best players in the league. I said, this is the best team. Right. This is the best team, top to bottom. I don't know how you feel about it, Legs, but I, I feel like the disrespect has been ongoing and it's bothersome. Is it disrespect? I think so, and I think they don't mind it, honestly, because yeah. it's given them an edge right now. They're fine with, with the amount of attention that they've gotten or lack thereof heading into the postseason. And you could see by the look, and Mark Murray didn't play well last night, but the way he had played up to that point, the hunger in his eyes and the mm-hmm. chip that he's playing with, and obviously what Jokic does every single night, they absolutely right now feel like they are a team that's going to win a title this year. Now, in terms of who would be favored, let's see, because let's see what kind of eye candy we get out of this next round, mm-hmm. because it might, if Curry averages 35 points a game and that's a six or seven game series, there's going to be an awful lot of people that think the Golden State Warriors are going back to the finals. Yeah, the guys on the other side have four rings each, and the guys in Denver still have to show you they can do it. That's not disrespect. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.